of all women are denied their bodily autonomy based on their ability to make their own decisions about healthcare, contraception and abortion, and when, with whom, and even whether to have sex. This is due to legal, economic, and social barriers to bodily autonomy and agency, including laws such as marry or rapist laws that allow perpetrators to escape punishment if they marry their victims. Harmful practices such as female genital mutilation and early marriage also violate the bodily autonomy of girls. But really, the most persistent barriers to bodily autonomy play out in daily life, reinforced by gender norms and stereotypes, and include sexual harassment and assault, assumptions about roles within relationships, and unequal burdens of care work, which impact girls' ability to participate in their own healthcare decisions, their ability to access educational and economic opportunities, and really their ability to engage as full citizens in their communities. And all those barriers have been exacerbated by COVID. It's also important to remember that members of minority groups are more at risk of sexual and reproductive health and rights violations and have less access to the resources and services they need to exercise their sexual and reproductive rights. So what are we doing to address these barriers? In recent history, legislation and global agreements to protect and advance the rights of girls and women have primarily come about because of the tireless activism and organizing of women's and youth movements around the world. In the 1970s and 80s, women's movements around the world were instrumental in advancing reproductive and sexual rights, particularly abortion rights. In the 1990s, the US Reproductive Justice Collective led by Black women and Sister Song's Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective challenged the framework of abortion rights advocacy in the US, from one simply about individual choice to a broader one about human rights. This broadened the global advocacy agenda on SRHRJ, a broad agenda that was reinforced and adopted at the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo in 1994. The reproductive justice movement has since become an umbrella movement for girls and women's sexual and reproductive rights and their agency and empowerment, racial justice, environmental justice, LGBTQI rights, and social inclusion more broadly. At the Nairobi summit in 2019, which marked 25 years since the Cairo conference, youth movements were instrumental in continuing to advance this intersectional agenda calling attention to the need to protect abortion rights, provide comprehensive sexuality education, and protect the rights of LGBTQI communities and individuals with disabilities. Not surprisingly, Girl Up Youth members participated in that summit. SRHRJ has long been a priority for Girl Up, and it's been the focus of advocacy efforts of countless youth leaders in our movement across the world. Our clubs and change makers are advocating for the range of rights that comprise SRHRJ. From advocating for LGBTQI rights in Poland and in the US, to addressing violence against girls and women in India, Kenya, Mexico, and Argentina, to advocating for menstrual dignity in Brazil, to abortion access in the US, Romania, and Argentina. This local and national advocacy is supported by global advocacy and agreements, and Girl Up leaders are also at the forefront of global advocacy, advancing progress on sustainable development goals number three, which focuses on health, and social development goal five, which focuses on gender equality. So when I think about the next march that I'll attend and the continued fight for sexual and reproductive health rights and justice, I know that I'm in good company. Today, you'll be hearing from fierce advocates, including Girl Up leaders who are working to protect and advance our rights all around the world. To get our discussion started, it is my pleasure to introduce Catherine or Kitty Colbert, a co-founder of the Center for Reproductive Rights. Kitty made her second appearance before the US Supreme Court arguing Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the 1992 case that preserved Roe versus Wade. She is the co-author of Controlling Women, What We Must Do Now to Save Reproductive Freedom.
Kitty will be joined in conversation by our very own Girl Up Teen Advisor, Shreya, who is a fierce advocate for gender equality. Take it away, Shreya. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sia, for the introduction. And um, Catherine, it's so nice to meet you and have this critical conversation with you today. I just wanted to say that it is such a pleasure to meet you and that I'm very inspired by your work and advocacy as an author, an attorney, um, an entrepreneur and leader within the um, reproductive rights space. And I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you today. Thanks, Shreya. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, you as well. And uh, I just wanted to remind the audience that um, you guys can feel free to put any questions in the chat and we can respond as we continue with our conversation. So with that being said, we can kick off with the first question that I have for you today. And it is, um, could you share a little bit more about your work in advocating for reproductive rights? So Shreya, I uh, started my career as a lawyer uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, one, my second job was with the Women's Law Project, and I started representing abortion clinics uh, throughout the state of Pennsylvania on the first day of my job. And I uh, continued to do that uh, for almost 20 years, uh, working uh, through the ACLU Reproductive Freedom Project, and then as a founder, co-founder of the Center for Reproductive Rights, I continued that journey. Uh, but my commitment to reproductive rights has continued well past my days at the center because, of course, reproductive and sexual rights are so connected to women's equality more generally. And that, to me, is the only way when we become equal citizens in countries across the world uh, that we will be able to exercise uh, decisions about sexual and reproductive health in a way that um, not only recognizes our uh, equality, but recognizes our ability to make important decisions about our lives. Thank you so much for that incredible response. And that kind of takes me to the next question. So we're talking about equality and reproductive rights and advocacy. Could you please explain the recent leaked opinion on abortion rights from the United States from the Supreme Court? So the opinion uh, was written by Justice Alito, who is one of uh, five members of the court who joined the opinion. So uh, I always say the, the, I learned everything I needed to know about the Supreme Court on Sesame Street uh, because you got to learn to count. And the only number that matters is five. Uh, Justice Alito's opinion includes five justices. Therefore, they have a majority of the court. And I don't see, while it was surprising that the opinion leaked, I don't see a lot of change there when the final opinion comes out. The, the basic news is the court has overruled both Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which was the case I argued in 1992. And it is said that the question of abortion must be sent back to state legislatures to make the decisions and state legislatures are free to both restrict abortion and ban it altogether. What that means in the United States is uh, about uh, over half of the women of reproductive age in our nation will have no access to reproductive health care in their home state. Uh, about 25 states will ban abortion from as far uh, east as Georgia, all across the southwest to Texas, north from the uh, Canadian border, down through the mountain states, uh, into, uh, into Mexico, um, all of those areas will uh, ban abortion. And that means uh, really three things. First and foremost, it means that women will need to travel to obtain safe reproductive health care, uh, because that will only be available in the states controlled by Democrats, mostly on the coasts and a few states in the center of the country. But women will have to travel, and they'll have to travel hundreds of miles. Um, some women will try to obtain the abortion pill, medication abortion, which is available around the world, but not really uh, widely available here in the United States. But I think uh, many women will try to obtain the abortion pill and self-manage their care. But that, unfortunately, will mean that they uh, will be subject to criminal prosecution uh, either themselves or uh, people who help them get the pill. Um, and lastly, uh, some women, uh, too many women, will uh, be forced to carry their pregnancies to term. 
and, and Shreya, the important part of all of this is this is not, doesn't affect all women equally. Those women who have less resources, poor women, young women, uh, women who live in rural areas, women who uh, are disabled, women who uh, are suffering from discrimination in the healthcare system, which is mostly black and brown women, will suffer the most. Uh, and they will have the least access to care. And that not only is wrong, uh, it is a, a responsibility of everyone to make sure that we can get the resources as widely available as we can uh, to the women most deeply affected. Yeah, I totally agree, especially the part where we are, you sh shown light on how uh, marginalized groups are going to be the most disproportionately affected by this decision. Um, is very scary and it kind of takes me to our next question, which you already kind of answered. It was basically, what's the impact, um, the immediate impact of the overturn of Roe versus Wade? And what is the impact for girls and young women? And what would the impact be outside of the United States? So uh, let me just answer that in a couple of ways. First of all, I think that the, uh, the draft opinion, uh, when it becomes law, uh, really opens the door not only to restrictions on abortion, but affecting a whole range of sexual and reproductive health care. Uh, women with wanted pregnancies often need to terminate those pregnancies when health concerns or uh, problems develop uh, in the pregnancy, so they will be dramatically affected. Uh, women who are forced to carry pregnancies to term will suffer significant health problems because, of course, uh, pregnancy is more dangerous than abortion. And while generally safe throughout the United States, for some women, particularly black and brown women, the rates of maternal mortality are much greater uh, than for white women. So for example, uh, in many states uh, who are likely to ban abortion, the maternal mortality rates are higher uh, than the rest of the country. And so all of the women forced to carry a pregnancy uh, may also be risking death uh, when doing so. But the other part of this is that the, the decision itself opens the door uh, for the elimination of what we call, or what lawyers call substantive due process, a whole range of rights that are based on the Liberty Clause of the 14th Amendment. And that means we're going to start seeing state legislatures attacking, and we've already started to see them, attacking trans youth, attacking um, contraception and the use of contraception, trying to eliminate Plan B, trying to eliminate the IUD and, and, and uh, birth control pill because they consider them to be abortifacients, uh, going after gay marriage or going after the uh, end of life care, all because those politicians believe that they have a right to impose their morality on the rest of us. And the reality is all of those kinds of decisions are made by individuals, best made by individuals, because everyone has different views and different positions in life. Uh, and you ought to be able to make the most important decisions for your lifetime yourself. It shouldn't be controlled by politicians. I could not agree more with the last statement you just made. And it's so, um... It's so shocking how many different populations are affected by this decision. It's not only like a lot of people have this perception that it really only affects like people who have uteruses or like women and girls, but it does actually affect so many other groups and it's so intersectionally tied with a lot of topics. So um, it is very scary for me as an advocate and also for uh, minorities and marginalized groups. So with all of this like happening in our world and all of this, like obviously, as activists and advocates, we get discouraged often. What motivates you to keep fighting for reproductive rights and to keep fighting for what you do today? You do, uh, and, and young people like yourselves, because of course, uh, when rights are taken away as they are, affecting millions and millions of women across this country, um, and frankly across the world, because the US has been a model for, for law in other countries, no longer, but it, it has been in the past. Um, uh, the only way to win back what we have lost through litigation is to become politically active. And if young women drive that effort, uh, if young women understand that the way we gain power is through politics, not through law, uh, 
I am very encouraged because, of course, uh, it is young women who can both drive the protest and drive the debate. And frankly, uh, women from the ages uh, when they can vote, uh, you know, at 18 up through uh, the end of their 20s, are the, currently the most underrepresented group in the uh, U.S. electorate. And so if they start coming out in huge numbers, uh, it will change uh, the outcome of elections. And that, to me, is the most important thing. We've got to develop a badass social justice movement, which really decries what has happened. But we also need to get politically active, work in elections. If you don't like electoral politics, hold your nose, because it's the only way uh, we can win these issues. And people like yourselves, young people like yourselves, are what encourages me uh, that we can turn this around. Not quickly but certainly at some point uh, in your lifetimes and uh, in mine. Thank you so much. That was very inspirational for me, and I'm sure that resonated with a lot of youth activists who are following um, the webinar right now. And thank you so much for that. Um, kind of circling back to the youth and feeling discouraged because of this, like the current events that have been happening, what are some advice that you have for them to remain um, resilient throughout their efforts? Well, I, uh, you know, years and years ago, when I was uh, uh, in my early 20s, I met a woman who was a Holocaust survivor. And she said to me at that time, you know, what makes what's with you Americans that you think everything can happen like that? You know, uh, social justice movements take years to build, to develop, to make change. And the most important part from my perspective is not only that you get active but that you are persistent in your activism because things don't change immediately, but they do grow together. And together we can make a difference, both for individual, you know, for the town council election and the school board election and the state legislatures and eventually Congress and the presidency. Uh, but we have to keep at it. It's not just something that happens with one election and one set of phone calls or one demonstration. We need to be persistent, keep at it for long periods of time. If anything, we need to learn from our opponents. They spent 50 years to reverse Roe versus Wade. Uh, they are now successful. Uh, we may have to spend 50 years to do it, to win it back, but it's important that we try. Thank you for that. That really helped and helped me as an activist as well. And um, this is to our last question. So what are some roadblocks you anticipate as we have to overcome um, the like the discouragement also as we continue to fight and um, sorry, as we continue to fight for power and agency over our bodies and promote sexual and reproductive rights, health and justice over the coming months and years? Well, the biggest roadblock is there will be a tremendous number of women who will be harmed uh, by the restrictions that are put into effect. Um, and that is discouraging to see our sisters and our mothers and our uh, children uh, suffer uh, as a result of bad laws. Um, so that is obviously the most important impediment and we need to lend aid to those women to help them overcome the barriers that uh, crazy legislators are putting up. But the other, I think you've really touched on it, which is the other biggest barrier is our own sense of frustration, like saying, this isn't important. Too often I hear, oh, you know, there's no difference between Republicans and Democrats, or, you know, the Democrats can't get anything done, so why should I bother? And the reality is there is a huge difference both between the parties and between those who help and those who don't. And, it, you know, as, as we've all been, uh, as Martin Luther King said about the arc of justice, the, the, the arc bending toward justice, we need to be there to push that arc. We need to be there to make an effect. And unless uh, all of you uh, do something that will uh, make change, uh, we can't expect change to happen. And I think that that's the most important thing. Find something that you can do. I don't care what it is. Work in an election, demonstrate, uh, write uh, sex education uh, manuals, uh, teach sex education to your friends and, and family, whatever it is, do something 
because the best antidote, as Joan Baez says, the best antidote to despair is action. Thank you so much for that, Catherine. That was so empowering and it was a very powerful conversation that we just had. And um, not only me, but I'm sure everyone in the audience um, definitely resonated with everything you said. And I know we're all super ready to fight and gain um, gain like voice over our rights and um, be able to fight for what we're passionate about. So thank you so much for this conversation. And that wraps up what... Um, what we have planned for you today for our first fireside chat. Thank you so much um, again, Catherine, for speaking with me today. It was a delight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Shreya, and thank you, Kitty, for such a such an engaging conversation. Kitty, thanks for the reminder that we're in it for the long haul. The impact of this ruling is going to be far-reaching. Um, and particularly be hurting those who are already most vulnerable. Um, and thank you for the reminder to do something. Um, and of course, the reminder that the hope um, really lies in the young activists that we're engaging, including Girl Up members. Um, it's now my pleasure to um, change the focus a little bit from the US um, to uh, a more global discussion and welcome to the stage Akshaya, our Girl Up Teen Advisor, and Evelyn Opondo, who is the Senior Regional Director for Africa at the Center for Reproductive Rights and a board member of FP2030. Over to you, Akshaya. Hey, thank you, Seal. I'm really excited to be here today, and it's really lovely to meet you, Evelyn. I'm inspired by your activism. Could you share more about your work in advocating for reproductive rights? Thank you. Thank you, Akshaya, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Evelyn Opundo. I started my activism uh, around reproductive rights sometime around 2004 when I joined a women lawyers uh, association where we provided legal aid and worked on a broad range of um, women rights, including reproductive rights. At that point, even within that organization, a number of members of that association were totally against reproductive rights and did not see how reproductive rights, particularly abortion rights, are interdependent with the other rights that they were promoting. And so I was interested uh, on SRHR because it was a difficult issue, one to articulate, but also an issue that was stigmatized, not only within that association, but within the community as well, and especially within the legal fraternity. And so I started uh, you know, building an interest around that. And uh, then I joined IPAS. IPAS uh, is a global organization that works primarily on abortion rights and access to abortion healthcare. I worked there before joining the center as uh, the senior regional director. I am particularly interested in SRHR advocacy because of stigma, the way it's stigmatized and the way it's leveled as controversial and therefore largely deprioritized by governments. Um, and I think advocacy for me on SRHR is critical because then it allows me and those that we work with to look at the, you know, the structural issues, the, the root cause of the problems and why and how we can address all those uh, problems. And in my advocacy, um, I have worked uh, and I continue to work to hold duty bearers accountable, particularly governments. And we do this through litigation. We do this through um, uh, advocating for legislative and policy reforms. We do this through uh, capacity building of uh, organizations, but also through the empowerment of women Girl and girls particularly, so that they are able to claim their rights. Thank you. I'm very new to this field. I'm actually still learning about it because sexual and reproductive rights aren't as talked about in India. So they're understood mainly in the context of certain issues like child marriage or female feticide. And all these are mostly featured during elections. 
Um, India actually has the highest number of maternal deaths worldwide, according to UNICEF India and uh, World Bank data. So, um, because only 22% of abortions are done through private or public health facilities, and lack of access to safe abortion clinics is a major issue here because um, stigma and attitudes towards those seeking abortions makes it very unsafe and difficult. So following this, um, why is bodily autonomy an important part of sexual and reproductive rights? Thank you. Um, and I'm always very interested to hear about India because I studied in India. And so I have a, a, a great interest in what's happening in India. Now, bodily autonomy is critical um, for all of us because a person's ability uh, to choose what they do with their body is critical in the ability to live a fulfilling life, with that, a life that has dignity, a life that's productive uh, in the society. And it also helps them to contribute to socioeconomic development. We see you know, the, res the resistance to uh, bodily aut autonomy, um, whether it comes uh, through abortion rights and through, um, you know, uh, contraception and, you know, uh, and the other examples that Sia gave at the beginning. But bodily autonomy really is the foundation upon which other rights are built. And so if you deny bodily autonomy and if we are not able to access or to, um, to uh, you know, to um, access our bodily autonomy, then there are several rights that we cannot be able to enjoy it. And, and if a woman or if a person is able to exercise their bodily autonomy, then also they will be able to, you know, they will be empowered as individuals, but also an, an empowered individual is able to, you know, improve, um, you know, empower their own family, empower their community and empower the, their, 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 their countries. And so it's critical for all of us to really begin to respect bodily autonomy. It's very true. The constitutional right of women to make reproductive choices is a part of their personal liberty. And it's an important facet of the right to bodily integrity. So it must be protected. We've seen some progress in the advancement and protection of reproductive rights around the world. For example, in Kenya, where you work, can you share more about the recent legal decision in Kenya? What do you think is driving that progress and how can we leverage that? Thank you. Uh, the recent decision, abortion uh, high court decision is one that the center litigated. And in this particular case, we represented um, an adolescent girl who was pregnant, had an unsafe abortion, and then went into a facility and uh, a medical provider helped her with the post-abortion care. The medical provider was arrested alongside uh, the adolescent. They were charged with procuring um, abortion. And the girl was then put in, uh, you know, um, in, in uh, detention because she was not able to pay uh, the, the, the bond, the bill, uh, uh, the bond that was provided by court. She was in pre actually in the detention for about a month before we were able to get her out. Uh, in this particular case, while this girl was uh, in the facility receiving treatment, the police went and got her from the facility, took her to the police station, forced her to uh, write a statement and sign without legal representation. Uh, they did not continue with treatment while she was uh, in custody. And, and uh, she was then charged. And so we went to court to challenge the way she had been treated, but also to challenge uh, you know, the charges, the abortion charges against her and the provider. And the court you know, gave very progressive decision. One, the court uh, said that uh, the police cannot charge um, a minor, an adolescent, without legal representation. That for that reason, that was very illegal. And secondly, the, the, the court said, you know, the communication between a doctor or a medic and their patient is sacred communication that police cannot just walk in and take. This is communication that is protected by the law and can only be accessed if there's a court order. And then the court also said, you know, 
abortion is a fundamental right and is an, a matter of bodily autonomy and a matter of uh, bodily integrity and, and impacts on the right to, to privacy along other rights. And therefore it's important that these rights are protected. The court then asked uh, the parliament to amend our penal courts so that uh, women are able to access uh, legal abortion without harassment. Now, what's driving this progress? We have uh, continued uh, to engage in advocacy uh, to implement the laws where the laws are good, but also to challenge laws and policies where they're bad, particularly where they hinder access to abortion services. I think it's also critical to acknowledge that there are women and girls who have been bold and who are willing to challenge violations of their rights. And without those women and girls, we are unable to go to court. It's also important to acknowledge the role of healthcare providers. You know, they, they can decide not to participate in advocacy, but those that we have worked with over a period of time are interested in challenging, you know, the harassment to providers. And so they're willing uh, to go to court and challenge this. And, and I, th I think the other critical thing is just the ability of uh, those in civil societies, organizations that work in terms of generating evidence that we have used to continue to showcase the magnitude of the problem of abortion and SRHR and the issues that are neglected. And then finally, uh, I must acknowledge that when you have a judiciary that is willing to be bold and are willing to make pronouncements on issues that are considered sensitive or controversial, then you begin to make uh, progress in the right direction. Thank That's you. Important. We're also seeing the rolling back or the regression of reproductive rights in areas like Poland and the United States. What do you think its impact is on the development of rights globally? Yes, certainly uh, what is happening in the US and what happened in Poland um, are important for the global context. What the immediate impact that we have seen is how these have re-energized opposition groups, groups that are working to defeat reproductive rights, particularly abortion rights. We have seen them you know, galvanized, they are ready to go. Uh, but I think it's also critical uh, for us as we look at what is happening in the US and in Poland to also acknowledge, you know, where there has been progress globally. And this is whether it's in Mexico, whether it's in Colombia or Argentina, you know, and even in, in other European countries such as Northern Ireland and in Asia as well, such as Thailand. And so we must acknowledge that and look up to those countries for inspiration. We know that the countries in Africa that will be most affected are those countries where the laws are not clear, the countries where we are struggling to change laws, where we are still struggling to make judicial uh, pronouncements. Uh, will, we will see that there will be some reliance uh, on Rome, but I think it's critical that we keep reminding them of progress, including in Africa. In Africa alone, between 20, to the year 2000 and uh, the year uh, 2021, 22 countries have expanded their abortion laws. And that's progress that we really need to acknowledge for us in Africa. And also Africa has, um, the, is the only region with a human rights instrument, the, the women's uh, rights protocol that explicitly protects abortion rights. And so those are progress and good progress in Africa that we will be fighting to protect. Thank you. Focus is very important. Um, we have a question from the audience. Harmony from Nigeria is asking whether there's a plan to expand the program or outreach to more African countries, um, Nigeria to be precise. There are lots of vulnerable women and communities over there, and most women still feel like they don't have a right to their bodies. Certainly, certainly. There is plan, there is great need in Africa, and we are just touching the base. And it's important that we are expanding our footprint and working with partners and people who are interested in pushing this agenda forward, uh, including Gallup and, and, and you know, our partners in Nigeria. 
So it's, it's critical that we continue to organize across the Africa region as a whole. Lastly, what is your advice to all the girls and young women on the African continent and around the world who are listening to you? Thank you. I think my advice one is for us to push back on the pushback, organize. You know, um, as Katie said before me, we have been fighting for abortion rights for years. And we know that we will make progress. And when we make progress, they will fight back. And so it's, it's critical that we continue fighting back and organize. And particularly for the youth, I think use all the tools within your means. The youth are now very creatively using social media. I think that's one channel that you must continue using. And we are all counting on you. We are working with you. And I'm excited to see you know, young people such as yourselves who are already taking these issues seriously. So speak up and use the tools that you have. And if rest, take a rest if you must, because you know, like with what's happening um, in row, a lot of people are deflated. Take a rest if you must, but you must get up again and continue the fight. We are in need for the long haul and we must join forces. We must learn from our sisters and brothers who are supporting us across the regions. We must learn where there's been progress. What is it that we can borrow? How do we galvanize at the global level? How do we support each other? How do we encourage each other? How do we build so that solidarity? So keep the fight on. Thank you so much. This was incredibly important. Now we're going to pass it on to Sia and the guests. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akshaya and Evelyn, for shedding light on the situations in India and in Kenya and across the African continent. Just a great reminder that even though we are seeing significant setbacks in some places, we are seeing great progress in others and that we are in it for the long haul and must bring to bear all the tools um, and, and energy that we can. Um, so thank you both for a very inspiring conversation. Um, it is now my pleasure um, to introduce um, some Girl Up youth leaders who are working in this area and who are leading advocacy with their clubs and their communities on sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. We will be speaking with Janvi, who is a club leader from India, with Carol, who is a Girl Up club leader in Brazil, with Denaya, who is a Girl Up teen advisor based in the United States, and with Chola, who's a club leader from Zambia. So welcome to you all. Um, and right off the top, I'd like to ask each of you to speak to this question. Why do you think it's important to fight for reproductive and sexual health rights and justice and to support girls' right to bodily autonomy? Janvi, I'll start with you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Sia, for the great introduction. And I think that fighting for sexual and reproductive rights is very, very much important right now because it's kind of a burning issue. Like how we fight for gender equality, we have to fight for this issue as well. Uh, because according to some statistics, more than 30 million women have no right to even use contraceptives. And a lot of cases happen like the maternal mortality rates are increasing. And in India, especially like, almost more than 50% of the women face these sexual and reproductive rights issues. And that is why I started advocating in India, first of all, and uh, from where I belong, I belong from a state called Bihar. And here people are very backward and uh, I think that they have enough awareness, but they don't come forward to speak about it. So I personally think that uh, young and aware people like me and all of us can definitely make a change in all of our communities because fighting for sexual and reproductive rights is very, very much important. It's at its peak right now. And if we will fight for it, then we will definitely see a more happier side of the globe. So yeah, uh, that was all I wanted to say. Thank you, Janvi. And thank you for that reminder that these rights are very much linked to our rights for gender equality overall. 
Carol, could you tell us why you think this is an important issue to be fighting for? Hello everyone, I'm so glad to be here. And answering the question, um, this issue in general, it affects um, so many people. And sometimes we think that it's just um, in health matters, like um, that this issue in hand will change just their um, health. But it uh, has a big influence in education, in um, their own uh, thoughts about themselves. So it's something so deep that it has to be changed um, by the root because it will not change. I, I can uh, give an example. In Brazil, um, one in five uh, young girls don't go to school because um, they don't have access to um, uh, good bathrooms to um, put um, their pad, pads on um or to just relieve them a little bit from the pain from um their period and that have a big influence on their education thank you so much carol absolutely sexual and reproductive health rights and justice are really linked to girls' ability to make bigger decisions about, um, about their lives and to be able to access educational opportunities um, and even economic opportunities. So thank you for highlighting that point. Um, Denaya, why is this issue important to you? Of course, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here, to be alongside all the panelists. I feel as though for me, reproductive justice is important because of three key tenets. One of the first ones from my background growing up in the United States, we've learned from a young age that the U.S. is a country of liberty, equality, and justice. But how can we call ourselves that if women don't have the essential right to choose, to make a choice about our body, to make a choice for our health and well-being, and to make a choice that can help us economically and overall just to live? If we can't have that choice, then we can't call ourselves a country of liberty and of justice. This. And I want us to be able to call us that. I want to grow up in a country where I know that me and my children and our ancestors and our descendants can have those fundamental rights. And that's one of the main reasons why I believe that fighting for reproductive justice is essential and critical for our generation. And another reason is that even if abortion is banned in the context of reproductive justice, that doesn't stop abortions. It stops safe abortions. Globally, 45% of abortions are unsafe. And in the United States particularly, there are 68,000 women who die annually because of unsafe abortions and as a result of pregnancy. These are numbers and situations that can be stopped. This is not something that's inevitable. We have the choice and we have the power to prevent these deaths and to prevent these consequences. And that starts by passing legislation when women have the right to their own bodies. And one of the last things is that when we advocate for reproductive justice, we're not only advocating for gender equality, we're advocating for racial justice, gender justice, economic justice, and rights for members of the LGBTQIA plus community. Research has shown for the longest time that it's black and brown women that are disproportionately affected by abortion bans, and it's those groups of people, my community, that bear the consequences of abortion bans in the United States. And so whether you are someone here today who identifies as a woman or a girl, or whether or not you're someone here today with a uterus, this topic is more essential to advocate for now more than ever before, because if they can rid women of our fundamental right to choice and our constitutionalized rights, any one of those rights can be stripped away from us. And that's something that we have to continue advocating for, for our generation and beyond. Thank you so much, Denaya, for reminding us of the intersectionality of this issue um, and how those who are already vulnerable are disproportionately um, impacted when rights are under threat. Um, also, thank you for reminding us of sort of the contradiction between what the US says we stand for and what is happening. And what is very scary is that if, as Kitty says, the Supreme Court opinion becomes law, then 
um, this will be the first generation of girls who have fewer rights than their mothers and their grandmothers. Chola, you are joining us from Zambia. Could you tell us why this issue is important to you? Hi, thank you for this opportunity to speak among us great panelists. So the reason I, I feel this uh, advocacy for sexual reproductive health and rights uh, is important. Uh, personally, in my country, it, give, it gives it uh, gives a girl child the 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 autonomy and the, and and them to make decisions on their own, and these decisions include their sexuality. These decisions include uh, them going to school. This, this these decisions include uh, when and how and where they're supposed to they can have sex from. Uh, you find that in our country, most people are. Uh, I, I excluded from learning from from learning comprehensive sexual education, and if I'm going to be talking about human rights, then and exclude comprehensive sexual education, which is part of sexual reproductive health and rights, then we're going to be killing a girl child, including a boy child. So therefore, it is important to advocate for the, for, for sexual reproductive health and rights because it's a cardinal uh, issue that is affecting a lot of young girls. It's a cardinal issue that is affecting a lot of young boys in my country. And you'll find that uh, people pass on hateful comments when, when, when it comes to a girl child. And this is because uh, boys and girls are not educated about sexual reproductive health and rights. And we need more spaces, uh, spaces that advocate for sexual reproductive health and rights, spaces that give out services to, to young girls, services, this, this include educating them, this include giving them contraceptives, this include uh, uh, access to safe abortions. If we're going to be saying we are living in a country where human rights are respected, then I believe that sexual reproductive health and rights should be respected and should be a fundamental basic human rights for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chola, and such an important reminder of how important education is. Um, both the access for, to education by both girls and boys and the access to comprehensive sexuality education. Chola, staying with you, could you say a little bit about what your club is doing um, in your advocacy for sexual and reproductive health rights and justice? All right, so uh, as a club leader, we, we mainly meet up uh, in, a, in, a, in a very safe space and we also accommodate in as much as LGBTQ uh, uh, rights are not legalized in my country. We have made our space a very safe space for LGBTQI members, uh, young girls and people uh, and teenagers who are willing to come and uh, get educated on, on, on sexual health and rights and basically women's rights. And also we recently uh, uh, did uh, an outreach program where we had the Minister of Information we also had the Minister of Youth and Sports, and uh, we took advantage for that of that opportunity uh, to to educate people that were coming at that event on on, on sexual reproductive health and rights, and why it, it is important to 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 ensure that messaging is it's 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 taught to 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 a lot of people out there and. These are key issues that the government is supposed to, to look into, like menstrual hygiene, even in those rural parts of where I'm coming from in my country, even in those parts where people are not able to access services, they should take those services there. Because they can't continue to, to bring services in, in, in urban areas where people are living well where people have access to, 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 to medicals and where people have access to, to medical care and medical services. They're supposed to take, the, to take uh, uh, those spaces, uh, adolescent youth friendly spaces to, uh, to outskirts where people don't even know what sexual reproductive rights are. People don't even know uh, what contraceptives are. People don't even know, we've, we, we have people that don't even know what a pad looks like in the outskirts of my country. and. These we've taken uh, uh, it upon ourselves as, as as girl up leaders in in my country and people that advocate for SRHRJ so that we can uh, 
include the government and the Minister of Youth and Sports to take these services to out to 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 to, to outside outside our community where we are in in Lusaka, which is the capital city, but to take it out there where people don't even know uh, about about these issues, where people don't even know that it is important to know about body autonomy. So therefore, these are, are, are things that we've. We've engaged in. We're engaging the government. We're in, we are advocating to to young girls in communities in the rural rural parts of of, of our country. We, 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 we haven't just centered in, in 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 urban areas, but we've centered on rural parts of the country. We also we also do donations. We give out uh, uh, pads. We give out menstrual pads. These menstrual pads are actually re reusable pads. Because we are talking about climate, uh, climate change, so we are actually we've actually endeavoured in advocating for for people to be using reusable pads, and these are are, are pads that we've actually skilled ourselves as as Girl Up Club. We've skilled ourselves, and we we have learned how to make these pads uh, through sewing. Uh, also, mm -hmm. I also have sewing materials. So we, we we saw these parts and we take them to rural parts of the country. So these, these are basically the things that we've been doing currently, and 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 we we we, we are yet to do more. Fela, thank you so thank much. You. It's incredible what your club is doing, working at so many levels. Whether it's creating safe space for LGBTQI youth, lobbying the government to keep their promises, reaching hard to reach youth in rural areas. So thank you for everything you're doing. Carol, while uh, Chola was speaking about menstrual health and menstrual equity, I saw that you were nodding. Um, could you share a little bit about your work in that area and your legislative advocacy? So um, here in Brazil, we made a big, big um, project that is called um, Free to Menstruate. Here in Brazil, all um, the club leaders have a big connection. We talk a lot about many things. And at the beginning of the pandemic, someone brought this issue um, that uh, many, many women, many people with a new uterus uh, were not having access to uh, menstrual pads because um, they didn't have money to buy it. So it, it started a discussion in the group chat that we have. And we, we started um, slow, we started slow. Um, each, each club making uh, um, their own fundraising campaign to raise um, menstrual pads and but later on um, a club for, from Rio de Janeiro uh, sent a message saying that they contacted a uh, um, political representative and he decided to help this issue with them and wrote uh, a law to be approved by um, all the others ab about um, including uh, menstrual pads in the uh, basic basket. That is something really common here in Brazil. Um, many, many people um, who, who can buy um, basic things um, they received this basic ba basket and the pets were not included in it. So that's where we started. And starting there, we um, united um, in states, uh, each state uh, has a group and we uh, contacted um, many, many political representatives. And here in my state, uh, what we did was a law. We were able to approve it last year. And it works in with four different things um, about 
menstrual virginity. So the first thing is education. That is something that we work a lot. Um, uh, my club and a lot of other clubs here in Brazil that we think that um, menstrual education is so important to um, everyone, not just um, people with an uterus to learn about themselves and um, what happens and why it happens. But for people who doesn't have an uterus and to, to understand more um, of what is um, a menstrual cycle. Uh, it helped uh, break many taboos and that's the first thing of the law. The second one is to, because here in Brazil, um, research is not well seen. So we decided to put in the law um, about researching about other uh, possibilities to um, change a, a bit of the um, people who start using more uh, eco-friendly um, hygiene items. So that's the second part because we know that um, menstrual poverty involves um, ambiental um, issues. So that's the second part. Um, the third is um, for the government to research um, about uh, the, uh, the community and collect that data about um, menstrual poverty here in Brazil because uh, something that we found out is that um, there was nothing about um, menstrual poverty. Um, the government never did something about menstrual poverty. And um, the fourth uh, was about um, helping communities to make their own uh, reusable pads. So it got approved. Um, we are waiting because here some, sometimes things go really slow. So we're waiting to uh, they finally start doing it. Uh, I hope that at least at the end of the year. And the movement um, uh, free to menstruate became, became so big. We um, participated in um, on the news, we appeared on the news. Um, many, many people in Brazil know about the movement right now. And um, the, um, it happened that um, uh, a political, uh, he, she made, it was something, thankfully. <laughs> Uh, she Carol, made Carol, thank you so much. This is, um, it's amazing to hear of the power that a Girl Up Club can, can wield in creating and changing a law that will have life-changing effects on girls and affect their ability um, to go to school, um, but also that you yourselves are educating government officials um, and holding them accountable for the work that they should be doing. So I really think it's a testimony to the, the power of your club and thank you so much for the work that, that you're doing. Um, Danaya, can you talk a little bit about the advocacy that you're doing in this area, particularly with a focus on the intersectionality that you mentioned earlier? Of course, absolutely. I think to start with earlier in the month, around May 18th, after the decision was released or the draft opinion from the Supreme Court, there was a nationwide walkout occurring in schools throughout the U.S. of students walking out of their classes in order to advocate for reproductive justice. 
And I had the honor to lead a walkout in my own school community in honor of that and to allow students to vocalize their opinions on reproductive justice in the United States. And afterwards and after the walkout, we garnered the momentum that we needed. We informed the student body that this is something that's happening and this is something that we care about. And now we are working to use that momentum from the walkout in order to advocate for reproductive justice in different ways. One of the primary ones that we're looking at currently is trying to look at education reform and assuring that issue, issues of sexual and reproductive justice and health and rights are ingrained in K-12 academia. I've also done work as a research intern at an organization in the U.S. called Gen Z for Change, where I conduct research on abortion policies in the U.S. and how they could be impacted given that given a Roe v. Wade reversal. And within that role, I also do a lot of look at intersectionality and considering how women who are both Black and women will be impacted by these decisions, or even how people in the LGBTQIA community could be impacted by a reversal of Roe v. Wade. And additionally, what young people can do to really make a change in this regard. And as a quick side note, one of the primary reasons and ways that we can enact that change is to vote. When the United States with the midterms coming up in November, it's crucial now more than ever to leverage that opportunity in order for us to elect legislatures who not only advocate for pro-choice policies, but also stand for women's reproductive rights and stand for women having the ability to have control over their own bodies. But in summary, that's a lot of the work that I've been doing in the US and plan to continue to do throughout the next coming months. And thank goodness you're doing that work, Danaya. Thank you for, for highlighting the different levels where advocacy can happen on SRHRJ, whether it's educational reform, whether it's research, um, similar to how Carol mentioned, the research that needs to happen to fill the information gaps and the policy gaps, and of course, exercising your power to vote when you can. Um, I know we are a little bit over time, but I'd like to ask everyone to bear with us. I'd love to hear from Janvi more about what you and your club are doing in this area. Hi, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I found my Girl Up Club, Girl Up Chicken, 2020. Uh, from since then, I'm working on various issues of our society, such as gender equality, menstrual, menstrual equity, and SRHRJ. So I think that my club uh, focuses more on rural areas. So because we think that in rural areas, there is a more lack of advocacy and awareness because here in urban areas and developed areas, people have connection to internet and they are connected to some kind of a media platform. So they are somewhere aware. But in the rural areas where there is no facility, nothing, people don't even know. And some women, uh, as Carol mentioned, that some women didn't even have seen a sanitary pad in their life. And uh, once I came across a story, which was like once when a woman was given a sanitary pad, she, she inserted the whole pad into her vagina, which led eventually to her death because she never knew that how to use a sanitary pad. So uh, I focus more on those people. And then I go to villages. I talk to women about uh, safe sex using contraceptions and just being owner of your own body. This is what body autonomy means. You have the right over your own body and the way you want to treat your body is the best way. So uh, I have also written a book upon global gender inequality issues, which is Shiro's Breaking Stereotypes. Uh, I wrote this book last year, which emphasizes on the global gender inequality issues. And it has a story of a girl, which tells you that how a girl from a very backward area goes to the topmost place of the globe. And right now I'm writing my another book, which is on menstrual equality issues, which is uh, totally based on the issues we as women face in our menstrual cycle and how we should take care of it. And in the seminars and workshops, which I organized in the rural areas or in the schools or in the institutions, I give it this book to free to all the attendees which come there. So uh, right now, uh, my next plan, our whole club is going to organize a seminar in the district bar association in my city where all the advocates will be present. So as this issue is totally about advocacy, so I think that if I talk to those people, then definitely they can make some impact in their own communities. Uh, that this is what our the motto of our club is connect to as much people as you can because uh, to as much people as you'll speak you'll connect your thoughts will get spread so uh, my whole girl we all are totally dedicated to achieving gender equality which is the goal of united nations for 2030 so we are working day and night hard to achieve that apart from our normal studies and our normal jobs and this is what I think we all the, all the girl club should focus. You should be definitely determined and focused to what work you are doing and what opportunities you are getting. Uh, so yeah, that's all I'm doing. Uh, thank you.
Janvi, that's a lot. So thank you for everything you're doing through your books, through your engagement. Um, I'm excited to hear that you're going for the lawyers because as we've heard, yeah. the law is so important. Um, and, and like Chola, your focus on reaching those who are in the rural areas is such an important part of the work. Um, it is never enough time. I would love to continue this conversation for at least another hour. Um, but we are already over time. I want to thank everyone who has participated today in, in, this, um, in this Girl Up talk, um, Shreya, Kitty, Akshaya, and Evelyn, and this esteemed panel, Janvi, Carol, Chola, and Danaya. Thank you so much. To all Girl Up members watching, if you have not yet joined our SRHRJ group in our online community, um, please go ahead and do it. It's a place where you can continue to connect and discuss these issues. So thank you, everyone, and we will see you at our next Girl Talk. Thank you so much for having us.